everyone. I'm just going to ask the formal council team just to put cameras on so I can introduce them in a second. Which will hopefully also confirm that people can hear me. Excellent. Um, so we're a couple of minutes past, so we'll make a start. Thank you to everyone for making the time um, to come and listen to some more detail around Share Prosperity Fund and how we're going to deliver it in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. Um, my name's Glenn Kaplan Gray, Service Director for Economy and Skills at Cornwall Council, which is the service responsible for delivering Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, and what we're hoping to do today is to go through a bit of the um, strategic content of the investment plan that we've approved and against which projects will be delivered, review some of the current opportunities which are open for funding uh, and mention some of those that will come along later, talk about the application process and then do a Q&A at the end. We are going to record the session uh, and then we'll put it on the Good Growth uh, website so people can look back. We'll also um, try and answer as many questions as they come in and we've had some previously submitted at the end. So if you want to ask a question during the session, um, use the Q&A uh, function, which has been enabled. We're not planning to kind of put hands up and bring people in just for the ease of managing it. So if you've got any questions or queries, put it in the Q&A box. We'll try and answer those as we go along. Uh, and then at the end, I think Stacey's going to sort of ask the team any ones that have come in frequently or difficult ones or that we haven't been able to address. If we don't get to your question, we will add it to the frequently asked questions section of the website, along with the recording of the session. And there's also a recording of the previous um, session last week about to go on the website as well. All of that from the team, I hope will take no more than about um, 30, 35 minutes. So we'll try and leave as much time as possible for questions. We're going to try not to deal with very project specific questions. So if you've got a very detailed question about your individual project, please handle that via the application process and the email that's available on the website. Otherwise, we'll get um, dragged down into a lot of, of detail. Happy to answer those, those questions, um, but maybe this isn't quite the forum for that. So uh, on the screen, got uh, Nathan Cudmore, who's going to do a bit about the um, calls that are currently open. Stacey Sleeman, particularly focused on skills, but some of the community and places elements as well. And then Katie Dowsgaard is going to talk about the application process and no doubt answer some questions at the end as well. So I think um, we'll kick off if that's OK. I was just going to say a few bits about how the um, Share Prosperity Fund fits with wider uh, government policy and some of the changes that people can expect to see from previous programmes, particularly European programmes. So if we want to share the slides, that would be helpful. I think Beth's going to do that. Thanks, Beth. Great, do you want to spin it on? Um, so I think from my point of view, just a couple of words of context. So Share Prosperity Fund is very much part of the government's approach to levelling up um, and allocations uh, to individual regions were made as part of the levelling up white paper back in January, February time. And what we've done uh, as a team within Cornwall Council over the past few months is translate those levelling up missions uh, and they're a lot broader than people will have seen before in terms of what we're able to invest in, what we're able to, to fund uh, and how they tie in with a wider range of um, projects and programmes. It's worth looking at those missions. But what we've done over the past couple of months and what's now been approved by Cornwall Council and the Council of the Elves of Scilly is a translation of those national levelling up missions into local priorities. And that's really what's set out in the uh, Share Prosperity Fund Good Growth Investment Plan. And it's against that investment plan that we'll be judging um, uh, applications for funding in the future. Do you want to, thank you. 
Um, so what we're really focusing on today is those invitations uh, to bid that are currently live. Um, the strategy that I was just talking about is split into three elements. So community in place, supporting local business and people and skills. In this slide, the middle uh, column, the activity, is all the activity that's going to be happening over the next uh, three years as part of the programme, but also kicking off in, in the next kind of few weeks and months. But the purpose of this seminar is very much um, to answer any questions people have about the live invitations to bid, uh, and we've highlighted what they are on that slide. Uh, and we'll go through those in more detail in a moment. Just a word on the last column there, the priority outcomes. One of the really big differences between this and previous programmes, as I say, particularly ERDF and ESF, is the extent to which uh, investments are, get, are made against outcomes, not necessarily outputs. So there are still outputs uh, that will guide uh, people's applications and they're still part of the criteria. Um, but instead of a very uh, constrained approach to those outputs and those output definitions and what sectors perhaps or what type of projects we can fund the focus is very much about what outcomes those applications will deliver so just as a reflection of that we've put some of those outcomes on the screen and they're much broader uh, than previously spin the slide on uh, thank you. And just a word on the budget. So the budget is significant over a three year period. Cormann and the Elsa Silly has got the biggest allocation outside of London, uh, and that's broadly split into about 15 million uh, in year one, which is this financial year, 31 million in year two and ramping up uh, to 82 million in year three. That does mean, given that we're kind of halfway through the financial year already, that there is quite a lot of pressure on spend this financial year. And that's partly the reason we've been driving some of the application processes to be quite tight. So we know that's causing people um, difficulties, but we do need for government uh, spend profiles to deliver that in year. So that's part of the explanation while we're doing uh, that and putting people, particularly over August, through quite a tight application process. So apologies for that, but we don't want to uh, be in a situation where there's any sense of handing money back or not being able to deliver. So that's why we're pushing that quite hard. And spin the slides on. Um, so just reflecting a bit more on some of the different approaches in this program to what we've had previously. Um, match funding, which was a very big part of previous programmes, um, is much more flexible this time around. So in previous programmes, we've had very set rates about match funding. There has, I think in nearly all of the uh, parts of previous ERDF programmes, been a requirement to match fund. That's not the case with Share Prosperity Fund. There are still uh, issues around subsidy control, compliance, and we will still be judging how much applicants are able to bring to the table in terms of leverage as part of a value for money calculation. Obviously, if you're bringing in additional private or public sector funding, um, that will improve your value for money uh, calculation and score. But it's not uh, across the board part of the all the in, in criteria. Um, clearly, where we're investing through the supporting local business, we're expecting businesses um, to have to bring some of their own investment and partner investment to the table, but as I say, much more flexible, flexible approach than previously. And in terms of delivery mechanisms and bringing share prosperity funds to market, uh, there's four essentially, open invitations to bid, which is primarily what we're talking about today, in-house delivery through Cornwall Council, where Cornwall Council is probably the only organisation that could deliver um, some of that activity, procurement and strategic commissioning, which will be starting later in the year, and then delegated grant schemes and um, processes. So particularly, we will be doing delegated grant schemes through uh, Growth and Skills Hub and through a new approach to community-led development. That's not what we're going to talk about primarily today, but they will be coming on stream later in the year. So this round of funding 
won't be applicants only opportunity to invest that there'll just be different delivery markets for some activity we'll spin that on <clears throat> and then just a couple of words on the cross-cutting themes we are determined to um, take a meaningful approach to cross-cutting themes and essentially that's around uh, the race to uh, net zero about environmental growth and about um, inclusion and equality. So some of you that have already read some of the paperwork will see, for example, that there is an absolute commitment to real living wage, both in terms of the, the jobs and outcomes that are delivered, but also for organisations hoping to be successful applicants. Um, so there are criteria based on those um, cross-cutting themes that we'll be taking really seriously. And if um, we'll probably come on to this a bit later, but in the individual calls, uh, we're making clear which part of the uh, criteria, what percentage of the criteria will be led by some of those cross-cutting themes. And I think I've only got one more slide. Yeah, so we're going to talk about um, the commissioning plan. I think spin that on again, Beth, thank you. Um, so just to say a word on timescales before I hand over to the team. Um, as I said, we are pushing uh, the timescales quite aggressively and quite tightly. That's because of the spend profile. Um, but just a word on governance and decision making, which I think is relevant. So decision making will be made by the two lead local authorities, so Cornwall Council and the Council of the Elder Scilly. Um, decisions on which projects and programmes to invest in will be made by an economic prosperity board, which will sit for the first time in October and be made up from um, cabinet members from Cornwall Council and full council members from the Council of the Isles of Scilly. Uh, you can see some of the dates that we're hoping that that uh, Economic Prosperity Board will be meeting. Um, I think some of the questions we've had have been about um, the fact that we have opened invitations to bid for three years, but built in review points. So essentially there are three year invitations to bid over some of the calls. Um, particularly the ones at the, the top there, so culture events and talent programme, culture heritage led regeneration, but also some others. Um, and our plan is to, to create some certainty around uh, what we're looking for in those three year calls, but also at which points we'll review uh, those applications and do the appraisals. And we've tried to set that out in the slide that you can see now. A couple of people have asked whether that means it will be on a first come, first serve basis. Um, so the answer to that is in a certain um, way, yes. So if we get a very strong set of applications in early, we'll be assessing and looking to spend early. However, we will always look at the quality of the application and we will also be doing a yearly commissioning plan. So at the end of, towards the end of every financial year, we'll be reviewing what's happened in the previous year. Um, sometimes I suspect invitations to bid will be oversubscribed, perhaps they'll be undersubscribed and there's not so much demand or capacity in the market. Uh, so we may change the balance of funding or we may change some of the criteria. So those timelines that you see in front of you are um, as we see them at the moment, but at the end of financial, the financial year we'll be reviewing that and seeing uh, how the market has been applying or not. Uh, and how some of the, the quality of those applications have been coming through. So I think on that, it's going to hand over to the team to talk about the individual um, invitations to bid that we have live at the moment. Stacey, you kicking off with that? Yeah, OK, over to you. Um, thank you. Yeah, if we could move on to the next slide, please, Beth. We'll um, deal with some community and places ones first. Um, so the first opportunity um, for funding is the Cultural Events and Talent Programme. Um, you'll notice that there's some um, boxes on each of the slides which are really useful. They give some um, great detail in terms of when applications open, um, when they close uh, and also the budget requirements. So I'll, I'll pick up some of those highlighted points on all of those projects as we go through. Um, so you'll see for this one it's an open invitation. Um, the applications opened on the 5th of August with the first review point on the 2nd of September and the applications closing in August 23. 
Um, the budget you will see there is revenue, that's £4.4 million worth of revenue. Um, and we have award limits there with a maximum of a million and a minimum of 100,000. So that gives some opportunities for some smaller and larger projects to come through. Um, this one is about interventions to engage communities, promote growth and wider um, participation in culture, heritage, heritage and creative. Um, whilst creating sustainable jobs and generating more year round permanent high paid employment, et cetera. Um, and then you'll see there some of the deliverables that we would expect from this programme. So we're looking at activity which seeks to develop growth and skills development through digital and immersive technology. Um, activities to increase high value national and international visitor spend and demonstrate cultural and artistic excellence through innovation and cutting edge technology. And then the very final one there, associated skills development programmes, which could range from outreach and volunteering opportunities to apprenticeships and bespoke specific development opportunities, um, particularly looking at collaborations with FE and HE providers also. Um, so if we could just move on, please, Beth. Uh, so, yeah, the second one is cultural heritage led regeneration and skills. So very similar. Um, time scales to the first one opening in August, pinch point of review point even on the 2nd of September and then closing on the 23rd of August next year. No, sorry, the 4th of August 23. Um, the budget for this one is split between revenue and capital. So you've got £3.6 million worth of revenue, capital of up to 7.22, with a total budget there of 10.82 million. Um, and again, some maximum and minimum awards with the maximum being 7 million and the minimum being 150,000. Uh, this one is very much around looking at the creative and cultural institution and heritage buildings and assets, regenerating places and community, driving pride in place and supporting the development of skills, sustainability and social mobility, um, and supporting the development, preservation and reimagining of our places and buildings. Um, so you'll see there, I won't read through all of them, um, some of the deliverables there. So some examples are rejuvenating communities through sustainable heritage, regeneration and use of assets, um, attracting inward investment, developing skills, knowledge and confidence of residents, including young people, um, and enhancing community cohesion and pride. Uh, next one, please, Beth. Uh, and then we've got Community Skills Hub. So this one opens on the 5th of August and closes on the 16th of September. Um, a revenue and capital split there with revenue of 1.7 and capital of nearly three and a half million pounds. Um, and award limits there with the maximum being the total budget of 5.198 million and a minimum award of 500,000 pounds. Um, this one is around Community Skills Hub, looking to establish existing buildings in order to strengthen the sustainability of the assets. It includes reimagining of community and education buildings within Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, and should, where possible, be aligned to programmes of digital skills, multiply and wider training and skills opportunities that are either being delivered now or will be proposals in later parts of the programme when we release other open invitations. Um, so proposals here are around enhanced awareness, accessing pride in local skills provision, delivering in partnership with skills providers to deliver high quality industry relevant and complementary provision that supports the local community. Um, access to basic skills opportunities and wraparound support, particularly around digital numeracy and literacy skills, um, working with local businesses to exchange knowledge, co-design skills development, um, and particularly looking at cold spots for participation um, and undertaking targeted activities. Um, and then in particular, working with primary and secondary schools and making sure that there's access to labour market information and intelligence within those local communities. Um, and then moving on again. And then we've got community connectivity and digital inclusion. Again, this one opened on the 5th of August, closing on the 16th. We've got a budget there of 1.5 million with revenue of 600 and capital of 900,000 um, and some minimum and maximum awards, the maximum being 1.5 million and the minimum being 150,000. Um, this one is very much about improving digital connectivity, inclusion and skills. 
um, looking to help communities within Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly to gain access to online services and information and also to improve the capacity of people in digital skills, civil society, education, training and employment opportunities. So in particular, we're looking for digital infrastructure in communities that might not have um, that ready access to the infrastructure required. Um, adaptations to community facilities to enable shared and or private access to devices and services, access to devices, data, and then training programmes in order to use those um, those pieces of kit and gain access to services within those communities um, and digital support for community facilities. Thank you. I think I might be handing over to Nathan for the next one. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, so this next section focuses on the, the two live invitations within the supporting local business strand of the fund, uh, with the majority of the other programming in this section due to emerge either later this year or in year two to align with the, the phasing out of the current programming, such as ERDF. And that will include elements such as business support, RDNI interventions, trade and investment, and sector specific activities. So, but, but concentrating on the two live ones, uh, this first one is the Strategic Business Enterprise and R&D Infrastructure Invitation, and it's looking to invest 18.7 million to unlock, a, unlock delivery of a range of workspace and enterprise infrastructure projects. Um, many potential applicants will recognise similarities with past economic programming here, such as the Priority Access 3 element of ERDF or the Local Enterprise Partnerships kind of growth deal and getting building fund programmes. So it's, it's a capital focus, but with elements of revenue to support uh, development and feasibility projects and the capital awards of between a half a million and five million and the revenue between 20,000 and 100,000. Um, and you'll find more detail on the various criteria in the initiation form on the Good Growth website, but applicants will need to consider things like the investment need and the, the gap funding requirement, um, any sectoral focus that's aligned to regional economic strategy, and obviously how the project will enhance business productivity and competitiveness. And this is uh, one of those uh, invitations that has got multiple application windows and review points up until August 2023. Um, so moving on to the next slide, Beth, if you can. Yeah, this the, the town, rural and coastal high street development uh, invitation targets kind of funding towards increasing the vitality of places across Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, uh, particularly focusing on business and productivity improvements on or near the high street or neighbouring shopping areas. Um, its value is 4.4 million uh, with a mixture of capital and revenue project potential uh, with awards uh, ranging between 30,000 and half a million pounds. Uh, the slide shows some examples of the types of activities anticipated to come through this strand, uh, be that around the development of new or existing buildings, the reduction of uh, vacant units on the high street or other business improvements to the streetscape, including the delivery of kind of net zero infrastructure, uh, but also potential ar activities around um, marketing and promoting new ways of increasing footfall. Uh, increasing dwell time and spend alongside um, any innovative approaches to retail and high street use and associated kind of skills programs. And again, this invitation has multiple application windows and review points up until August 2023. And now I think we move to the multiply invitation. Let's back to Stacey. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, Beth, if we could just move on a couple of slides, please. Do you want me to start talking to it, Katie, or Beth, are you there to move the slides on, please? I think carry on, Stacey, and the slides will carry catch on. up. Oh, there we go. There we go. Super. OK, so thank you. The final one is Multiply Champions. So as Glenn said, we've got an earmarked budget for Multiply as part of the wider Share Prosperity Fund allocations Cornwall. This is our first open invitation. It's 100% revenue. Um, with the application window opening on the 5th of August and closing on the 2nd of September. 
Um, the revenue budget is 428,996, so just um, shy of, well, yeah, 428,000, um, with um, the maximum and minimum being the same. So we're looking for one project to deliver um, the entirety of the Multiply programme. We see this um, as an opportunity to look at an overarching project to develop Multiply champions to oversee the delivery of the wider program and to ensure that we get as many learners onto the other interventions that we're commissioning onto the program. So the objective of the Multiply program is to increase um, levels of functional numeracy for adults age 19 plus. Uh, through this open invitation, we want to establish a network of Multiply champions who alongside a new website and social media activity will be tasked with supporting the promotion of Multiply program across the region and helping to increase access to the programme and numeracy courses. Um, so some deliverables there is around creating that multiply champion role. Um, individuals could represent a community or an organisation or an employer um, and champions need to have credibility and target communities so that we can tap into existing social networks and identify potential learners. Um, we would want to work with community organisations to recruit volunteer um, multiply champions to support the promotion of the wider program. Um, looking at building a supportive infrastructure for multiply champions and appointing a multiply champion lead so that there's peer support in place for those multiply champions. Um, ensuring a collaborative and non hierarchical relationship between multiply program course delivery organisations and champions. Um, ensuring necessary training for those staff and making sure that we've got really robust community engagement toolkits in place um, with volunteers having some form of financial reward as part of that project um, and an evaluation built into that opportunity as well. I think that's the final one on the opportunity, so I think I'm handing back to Katie, possibly. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, yeah, so just a couple of slides, um, warning everybody, just a couple of slides on um, the application um, process. So just to, to start off by saying that I will I will rattle through this these slides. There's, there's quite a lot of information, but don't worry, all the information is also on, on the Good Growth website. So every single slide that I'm going through, there, there will be more information on, 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 on the website um, for you to have a look at. So Beth, if we start with the, the, the next slide, um in terms of uh who can apply and and the process so i think the first thing to say um is that um everybody any organization uh, with a legal status can apply for the, for this fund so we've had questions around can uh town councils apply can um you know uh, small businesses single um uh, uh, operators uh, apply, and 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 the answer is um, yes. As long as 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 an organisation is set up with a with a legal um, status, um, you are able to um, apply. So the the process we've put in place is that we are asking, as a first mandatory step for everybody to fill in an inquiry form via the the Good Growth website. So that is a is a one page um, form that asks for some some really basic information about um, uh, what the project is, um, uh, uh, yeah, a short description of of what you are um, trying to achieve through the project, what kind of um, costs are, are involved in the project, what kind of um, funding you are um, looking for, and then some contact um, details so we can we can get back in in touch and we will use that um, inquiry form to try and steer you to the right place um, in, in the good growth um, uh, uh, program. And for those of you who um, are a, a really good fit for any of the open um, invitations that are currently live, we will send you um, an application form um, to, 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 to fill in and respond to those different timeframes that Nathan and, 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 and Stacey have just um, been through. There will be some cases where a business case is, is required, but we will let you know if that's um, the case. And I think that will in particular be for really big um, capital um, projects. Um, but we won't ask everybody to fill that in. We will generally ask people to fill that in once there is a in principle decision to um, to award funding to to a project, just to make sure that we, we're, we're not wasting um, 
anyone's time in terms of, of, of that process. So if we flick on to the next slide, um, in terms of what support um, there is for, for applicants, there is quite a lot. So uh, as I said before, um, everybody needs to fill in the, the, the inquiry form, and that's both if you feel that you've got a project that fits really well into any of the, the current opportunities, but also if you have a project where you think, I don't really know where this fits in, please just fill in the inquiry form, and then we are there to, 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 to look at that um, description of your project and help you steer steer you to the right place and signpost you to the, to the best place in, in the programme. And that may, for some people, be uh, here's an application form, go on and, and apply for one of the open opportunities, but it might also be that we advise you that there is a delegated grant scheme that, you know, Glenn was mentioning some of those coming up around um, community activity where we think your project will, will fit into. So we will hang on to your uh, details until um, that is up and running and then um, that delegated grant scheme will, will, will get in touch with you. I should say that um, we are just giving advice. So we are not preventing anyone from applying. So if we we come back to you and say we don't think that you 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 fit um, to, to any of the open invitations, your project may be a little bit too small. Um, we are not preventing you from from applying. If you want to still go ahead um, and 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 apply, you, you're more than um, welcome to do so. And you just let us know, and we will send you the the the, the relevant um, application form. There is also um, specialist support available if we flick to the next slide. Um, so once you are writing um, your application form and you've got specific um, questions, we've also um, put a, a, a support offer in place around um, specialist support to help you um, with um, designing um, uh, your project and making sure that that's described well in the application form. So we can't write the application form for you, but we can absolutely be there and support you with, with some of those tricky questions that come up during the, the, the filling in of, of, of the application um, process. Um, so again, um, if you fill in the inquiry form and, and you get to the stage of the application, let us know and we will put you in touch with this specialist um, support um, offer. Generally, we're saying it's 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 limited to, to four hours per, um, per, per, per project um, and that we are targeting it, targeting it to, to smaller organisations. But come and talk to us and, and we will signpost you and, and, and be there to, to support you. So the next slide just takes you through um, the application form. So important to say that there is a uh, application form on the website. That is a um, an example of an application form. It's the master application form. So it has all the questions um, in there for, for everything that we could um, ask you. But it's really important that you go through the inquiry form stage so that we send you a tailored application form for the specific um, open invitation that you are applying for, because that will take out some of the questions that are not relevant for that specific um, open um, in invitation. Um, uh, uh, but it's, it's there on the website for you to have a look at to get a sense of, of, of what type of questions um, we will ask you if, if you get to um, the stage where you want to apply for, for, for one of the, um, the open invitations. And, and that application form is, is the main uh, information from you that we will use to um, assess your um, application once it, it, it comes into us. Um, the next slide just outlines um, a, a kind of high level uh, overview of the difference between capital and revenue expenditure. So all of the initiation forms have a, 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 a maximum amount available, but it will also have a, a split between how much capital expenditure and how much revenue expenditure is available. And you will need to have a think about that when you are um, uh, designing your project, figuring out which of the open invitation that it fits into. So, so broadly speaking, as, as is listed on, on, on this slide, Capital expenditure is, is generally, you know, one off um, uh, purchases, uh, acquisition of land buildings, it's around building and, and, and construction um, or professional fees associated with that. It's around plants um, plant and machinery um, items, um, uh, generally um, items of, of equipment of, of, of larger um, value. Whereas revenue expenditure generally is around um, ongoing uh, expenditure around staff costs, for example, um, business travel, um, 
contracts, consultancy um, costs, marketing and, and publicity um, and, and, and that type of um, activity training as, as well as is, is listed there. Um, important for this um, programme, the Good Growth program is that um, spend is is eligible um, as Glenn was saying we're already into year one so it's in principle eligible from the 1st of April um, of this year um, and must be completed um, by the 31st of March um, uh, 2025. Then there may be uh, specific things um, uh, outlined in, in the initiation form of the particular um, uh, uh, um, open invitation that you're looking at. So important to to read that through, but that's kind of the the the, the general um, uh, overview of it. If we look at the next slide, there are some things that government have um, outlined that are ineligible uh, costs. So I think important to have a a look through of that list and making sure that your project doesn't include um, paid lobbying, for example. Um, uh, VAT that's reclaimable from from um, from government and 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 so forth and 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 so on. Um, so uh, important just to familiarise yourself with with that list of of um, ineligible ineligible costs. Um, next slide is around the, the grant funding um, agreement, and I think we've we've tried to. Um, make you aware of what will be in the grant funding agreement up front. So we have on the website um, a, a grant funding agreement um, that you can look at. So it's under the applicant support um, pages on um, the website. Um, we encourage all of you to have a look at that grant funding agreement before you put in your application, just so that it's, it's no surprise what will be um, in that standard uh, grant funding agreement um, that you will be asked to sign if your um, project is um, successful. And also worth noting that um, that will kind of sit on top and then the, 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 the grant funding agreement will also include the, the application form and the um, additional documents that you have submitted to us that will form part of, of the, the final grant funding um, agreement. Um, again, the grant funding agreement will will specify audit requirements and um, there will be um, uh, audit requirements and as such um, any successful applicant will be um, responsible for having um, and maintaining uh, records and, and, and files. So I don't think that's 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 anything new, but in, important to say and, and, and the general rule, although it may be different for for from contract to contract, but the general rule is that we require a seven year retention of, of, of documents and, and files related to um, uh, the, the projects. Um, so the next slide just goes through the appraisal process. So once um, projects come in um, uh, in advance of, of those review points, in advance of those um, uh, deadlines, um, the team will, will look at those applications and um, uh, assess them based on on four overall um, criteria. So those are um, strategic alignments. Um, does it fit with the um, the good growth investment um, plan? Um, good growth principles. So um, what what previously was known um, under EU programmers programs as, as cross cutting themes. We're now calling that good growth um, principles. So that's around. Uh, making sure that jobs are, are are well paid, making sure that um, environmental concerns, social concerns have been thought into the the, the principles, and and each project will be assessed around those good gro growth principles. Um, deliverability will be really important. We've talked about the the kind of in year spend um, targets, so I think that that will be really important um, to make sure that um, projects can deliver within a in that relatively short time per period before. Um, end of March 2025. And then lastly, um, value for money uh, will be assessed as well. So next slide just takes you through um, subsidy control and um, VAT. Um, so although we are, are no longer um, subject to, to EU state aid rules, we, we still have to adhere to, to subsidy control rules. Um, and I think there are important considerations there. Um, whereas we don't have kind of a strict um, match funding requirement, 
we are required to, to be able to demonstrate that um, uh, projects um, are you know, funded in, in a proportionate way and, and, and um, are not receiving more grant funding than um, uh, would, would make the activity happen um, without it. Um, but again, more information on, 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 on the website. Similarly, um, and I'm I'm hurrying up a bit because I know that um, Glenn wants to leave lots of questions for time for questions. Um, there is a slide on on, on procurements um, procurement, and for that one, there is a, a full procurement um, policy um, on the website for you to um, have a look at um, and and um, familiarise yourself with in advance of of submitting um, an application. We've also had lots of questions on the, on the next slide. So I think in terms of, of claims and payments, um, once um, six, uh, projects have been successful and a grant agreement is in place, claims will generally happen on a quarterly basis um, and be based on incurred expenditure and evidence of defrayal. Um, but there is a possibility for um, a, a different approach where that's appropriate. So um, again, come and talk to us, um, explain why we need to take a different approach if, if that's the case for um, individual um, uh, uh, projects. But the standard uh, approach is uh, quarterly claims based on, on expenditure and evidence of um, defrayal. Um, project change requests. So. Um, it is possible during the lifetime of a, of a project to um, request a, a change if there are things that are changing in terms of the size of the project, or the nature of, of, of the project. That little table outlines um, kind of the trigger points for when a formal um, project change request is um, is needed. So if, if the outputs and outcomes that have been agreed in, in the grant funding agreement change with more than, than 10%, um, if the overall project costs um, change with more than, than 10%, then there is a need for a, a formal project change request. Um, I think what's important to say in terms of that is that we, of course, expect all projects that are submitting applications to have a really good think and consideration of um, risks around inflation or risks around um, a tight labour market where it might be more difficult than usual to, to recruit. And we would expect those type of risks to be thought into your initial um, project application um, in terms of, of, of costs and, and, and mitigations put in place to, to deal with those, um, those risks. And then last slide um, in terms of branding and publicity. So again, there is a branding and publicity um, policy on our website. So have a look at that. But for successful um, projects, we do require um, branding and publicity um, in terms of uh, any uh, documents, websites. Um, and if it's a physical um, assets, there will also be a requirement around having a, a plaque um, that that um, uh, identifies where the funding um, has um Come from. So I think that is that is all the slides. But as I said, more information on 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 the website. Feel free to contact the the Good Growth website with with questions as well. Um, and then I think um, Stacey, you've got a whole um, set of pre um, submitted questions to to take us through. I have. Thank you. Uh, I will just start those ones now. So yeah, the first one we have is: Does the procurement have to be completed before the application deadline? Um, I think Nathan, you're going to take that question. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, no, no. All procurement doesn't have to be um, fully in place before the application deadline. I think there'll be an expect expectation around, uh, you know, cost certainty in terms of the bids coming in. But um, I'd say uh, one thing to focus on is uh, applicants looking at that. The, um, the applicant guidance on the Good Growth website, it's got some details in there about, you know, public funds and public uh, so, so um, processes in terms of um, and values for require, requiring quotes and formal tendering processes. So I'd say to, to have a good through, look through that guidance. Lisa, thank you. Um, and then the next one is, are there minimum amounts that we have to bid for? And Katie, you're going to take that one. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. So, so I think um, both you and Nathan have 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 um, taken people through the, the the slides of each of the open invitations. There, there is a, a minimum grant of award for each of those um, uh, open invitation, and 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 it differs. So, for example, the 
the High Streets one that Nathan took us through has a, a minimum um, grant award of, of um, 30,000, whereas as others, I think um, the cultural events one has a, has a minimum grant award of, of 100,000. So it's important that people have a look at the, the individual um, initiation um, uh, documents just to, 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 to see what the minimum grant award um, is. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Katie, this one's next one's for you as well. What is the time scale for year one applications and what about future years? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess we've been through the, um, the, the the deadlines for each of the the open invitations. So I think again, look at the the um, uh, initiation um, documents if if people are still in doubt after um, the presentation um, of the slides that that you and Nathan went through. But I think it, all of the open invitations at the moment are in principle for three year funding. So it's up for the projects to to let us know in their application. Um, how long their their project is um, intended to, to 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 be for, um, and and how much funding they 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 need for it over that um, period of time. So it's not like they have to reapply for year two funding. The the application is to tell us what funding they need in year one, what funding they need in year two, and what funding they need in in, in year three, and what they will deliver for it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Katie, it is you again. When do you expect successful projects will be receiving offer letters and able to start delivery? Yeah, so I, th I think that depends a little bit um, in terms of of when the the review points, when the deadlines for for the open invitations is. But if we take one of the open invitations that had a ha has a deadline of the second of um, September, so that's that's Friday next week, isn't it? Um, time is 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 going fast. So for those ones. Um, the team will assess those applications um, during September and then they will make sure that they are um, put to the Economic Prosperity Board when they meet on the 10th of October. So if um, projects have provided all the information that is needed for, for that assessment and, and they go to the um, 10th of October um, Economic Prosperity Board um, and are successful, then then a then a, a offer of a, a, um, a grant funding agreement will, will happen shortly after that meeting. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've received several questions about exclusions to the programme. So examples have been, are there any industries excluded? Is it open to farmers? Does the funding support online businesses with remote working? Um, does any of the skills funding apply to hotels, for example? Um, so I think, Nathan, you were going to take that question um, and answer from a kind of generic perspective for all of those questions. Yeah, but only really to say that there are no exemptions that are industry specific. Um, and, it's, and it's all based around whether the proposed project delivers against the strategic, strategic vision set out in the investment plan and, and what it's delivering in terms of those outputs and outcomes specified for the open applications uh, invitations that are being submitted against. Excellent, thank you. And Glenn, the next question or a couple of questions are for you. Um, can projects cut across plans activities in the investment priorities? And if a project is positioned to attract funding areas, say culture and heritage, as well as town and coastal high street development, could funding be apportioned between each pot? So I think the short answer is yes, you can make um, more than one application as an organisation. You can also make more than one uh, application for the same project, broadly the same project against different strands, but you have to put in separate applications because we are managing the budget and the outcomes and the outputs within those strands. So yes, you can do it, um, but make sure you're not double counting in terms of the outputs and the outcomes. Um, you can also be, you can also lead applications and be a delivery partner. Um, so I would say just look at the detail of the individual um, invitations to bid in terms of the outputs and the outcomes and where the kind of line might be between different elements of, of what you want to deliver and have a look at the, the small print, I guess, in there. But fundamentally, yes, you can put more applications in. Yes, you can bid across. Uh, share prosperity constraint. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question, in what, in what sense, if at all, does the high street label apply in rural communities? And Nathan, can you take that one, please? 
Yes, it's a good one. Um, I think generally if the project fits within that criteria within the uh, the town rural and coastal high street, uh, you know, invitation, then the, the programme would welcome those proposals coming from all all areas of, of Cornwall's Silly, including the rural kind of communities. And it's about making sure the proposals are aimed at those, you know, neighbourhood shopping areas, whether it's in smaller villages or the hamlets, uh, in, in rural and coastal areas, as well as the towns. So it's about, you know, does it deliver against those criteria within that invitation is the main thing. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think we covered this one off in part in the presentation, but Katie, if you could come in. Um, is it first come, first served? Thanks, Daisy. Yeah, I, I think um, I think Glenn's already touched on that in terms of of the, the the different review points. So you know, for for the open invitations where there is a a year to apply, but there's four different um, review points and there's a finite um, amount of, of of money to to bid against. Then I guess it is it is there is a certain risk in terms of if if you put your your bid in right at the end, that the, the pot could be a lot smaller than it is in in the beginning. But I think, as Glenn was also saying, it's it's not just a question of of projects coming in first. It's also a question of projects being the right projects and being good projects. Um, and I think again, if if you engage with the inquiry form uh, and make sure that we are aware that you are in the process of of um, developing a a project, that of course will feed into the decision making pro process. So if we are aware of a project coming down the line but not being ready, maybe until uh, March next year, and um, that that's important for us to be aware of, so we can take that into consideration in 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 the decision making um, process. Super, thank you. Um, and then this one's quite um, an important one. Will payments to successful projects be made in retrospect? And I think you covered this slightly, Katie, in the slides, but if you're able to take that one, that would be super. Um, so I, th I think it's a bit kind of a woolly answer. In, in, in principle, I think we would want to see um, uh, payments being made um, based on on expenditure after the, the the kind of grant contract comes into to, to play. But um, th there is th there could be instances where there is a, a justification for why um, uh, spend um, could come into consideration that that had already been um, undertaken. The project was already. Uh, happening it was already delivering um but i guess the question we would have and the conversation we would need to have is if it was already happening and and, and taking place why does it need good growth funding so i think in in principle yes it's a possibility but in general we would want to pay based on expenditure after the, the grant agreement comes into place super thank you um, and then Nathan, if I could ask you to take the next one, can town councils be lead applicants or is there a different process for them? Is there funding for CICs? Um, I, uh, yeah, there's there's no issue with town councils applying, so it's any um, legal entity can apply for the funding um, and that applies to CICs as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, Glenn, if you would take the next one, that would be great. Um, can projects which are already part of the town deal programme apply? Yes, so there's no, there's nothing that would stop uh, a town deal programme applying. Um, I think applicants would just need to think about value for money, uh, match funding, double counting particularly of outputs, because some of those town deal programmes are already set and have allocated uh, outcomes and outputs. Um, so I would say, no, there's not, um, but you need to be very careful with those outputs, double counting and what you're actually bidding for that's additional. Super, thank you. Um, and then another one, if you wouldn't mind taking it, Glenn, so I know you covered it in the slides. Does match funding improve the chance of success and are there intervention rates? Um, there are target intervention rates set out in the individual invitations to bid and they do vary. So there is less of a target around the places and community strand. 
where clearly community groups, um, organisations, particularly dealing with challenging client base or areas might have higher costs and might not be able to bring in a uh, higher level of leverage and, and match funding and actually quite a lot of projects in previous programs that were really good projects didn't go ahead because they couldn't bring in match funding. Um, clearly, uh, subsidy control, nearly said state aid, subsidy control does apply um, across the programme, but particularly with um, the kind of supporting local business strand. I think where those uh, where there are businesses looking to access funding, we've got higher targets. I'm generalising and, and do look at the individual calls, um, but we have got slightly higher targets. So I would say, yes, the more funding you can um, bring to bear, particularly with those private sector led bids, the more chance you have of being successful. But if the project is scoring really high on other criteria, so strategic, uh, alignment, good growth, cross-cutting priorities in the appraisal, the overall appraisal, that will come to bear as well. But as a general rule, yes, leverage will score you more points, particularly within that part of the appraisal. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Katie, I don't have access to any questions that are coming in through the chat bar. I'm not sure whether that's up and running. Um, James, was there anything that's come in that we wanted to raise? Well, I'm conscious we've got three minutes left. Um, if not, we can do another couple of questions from the ones that have already come in. So there's one question that's just come in that might be helpful to clarify. So someone's asking if uh, if a cost for the project has been put on the inquiry form, is that deemed the maximum value for the project or can that figure be upped when there's an application put in? Um, I would assume that uh, this can be changed at application form level. Um, so that would be that would be my view on that. I don't know if anyone else has got another view. No, I think that's right, James. So um, the point of commitment and setting the actual um, level of the application is at the final application stage. So it can change between those first two processes, as far as I'm concerned. Super, thank you, James. Any others that you've had come in? There's there's some that we haven't answered, but obviously we'll need to pick up in the FAQs because they're quite detailed. Okay. Um, so I would say that we've covered most of the simple ones. Okay, super. So um, do you want me to do one more from the ones already submitted, or Glenn, did you want to round up a little bit? Let's do one more and then we'll round up. Okay, super. Um, so one here. Um, if a project requires planning permission, which has a favourable favourable response from its town council, can it still apply for funding? Um, so, which has a favourable response? Did you say? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, if a project requires planning permission, which has a favourable response from its town council, can it still apply for funding? Um, I mean, I can take that one if you want to. I think. In the main, it's just making sure that all necessary um, consents are in place prior to making that application. And then, of course, if you've got town council support or um, parish council support, I think that would be in your favour too, because it would obviously have that local support. But Glenn, if there's anything you wanted to add to that. The, the only thing I would say is if you're putting in a capital application and you need planning permission for that, that will be picked up as part of the deliverability section of the appraisal. Um, so, you know, there are different stages to the planning system. The further you are along that planning system, the higher you're going to score in terms of deliverability. So if you have just put in an application, you don't know the result, that's, that's not going to um, rule you out um, by right, but clearly you're going to get a lower score in terms of deliverability. So I think uh, the more certainty, the more consents you have in place, the higher you'll, you'll score as a general rule. Um, I'm conscious, we sneak that one in, We're con I'm conscious of time. There have been quite a few come in on the chat, just to confirm, we will answer all of those in the next kind of 24 hours-ish and put them on, add them to the frequently asked questions section of the website, which we're kind of updating on a daily basis. So 
Um, do check in there for the answer. Thank you to the team for running through quite a lot of detail. Thank you to everyone for kind of bearing with us um, and asking questions and listening. It's a new programme, so we're still um, finding we have new questions, uh, which is always helpful. So if you've got any more, do submit them and we'll we'll address them and publish them for everyone. So I think given we're a minute over, I'll just say thanks to everyone and have a good rest of the week. Cheers.